Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm Jen Whitmer and I help teams and leaders solve conflict, cultivate great communication so we have whole and empowered teams. And every week I come on with a Monday mentor, somebody who is a leader, an expert in their field to help us grow as leaders. And today I am so, so just so excited to have my friend, Margaret Weniger. She is an expert at helping women and a sales expert. She has done so much work in the tech industry and she has a lot of experience with our topic today, being a women leader in a male dominated industry. And she's just going to give us so much wisdom today. So let's welcome Margaret. Hello. Hello. I'm so glad that you could join us today from your cozy chair. Uh, it's so lovely. <laughs> so lovely. Thank you for having me. This is such Absolutely. a treat. Absolutely. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, so I always, you know, if you're here and let us know that you're here in the comments, that you're here live and where you're coming in from. If you are watching the replay, let us know you're watching the replay. And I'm going to kind of start the same thing with Margaret. Where where are you in the world? And tell us a little bit about how you got here talking about helping women leaders in this way. Yes. Isn't it so funny how what you end up doing, you, you never visualized for yourself when you started out that that glorious career of yours. <laughs> Did not know that what I do now was a job six yes, years ago. Right. No, I know. <laughs> the beauty of the beauty of discovery. Uh, well, yeah. I am coming in from Atlanta, Georgia, so I I'm located down here in the south. And uh, as far as how I got to where I am today, so I fell backwards into tech sales in my mid twenties. Um, and was selling technology to swim coaches. I was a swimmer. That was my background. And there was a company trying to hire somebody who had swam. And fast forward over the next 10 years, I continued to grow my career building and scaling high growth software sales organizations. And I really enjoyed putting process in place, building repeatable processes that could help us with our scale, and then bringing in and developing people and talent. That was really, there was kind of this combination of loving to have the process and then really caring passionately about people and developing them and understanding what made them tick. And so about, probably about five years ago, um, I remember I never noticed my gender at work before. And it didn't happen until I'd become a mother. And mm -hmm. I remember going to a conference and I was actually pregnant with my second. And it was a tech startup conference. There's thousands of people that go to this. And I walked into the hotel lobby. I was six months pregnant, this giant belly. <laughs> and not only was was I looking at a sea of men, the few women that I saw at the event over the next couple of days were younger than me and certainly nobody else that was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so it was this very obvious reality that I was in this environment that nobody else looked like me. I didn't really see people at my stage of life. And it caused a lot of internal conflict of, mm -hmm. what does this mean for me? I have big dreams and big aspirations. And so I ended up having the opportunity to work with a coach in my last role. And she was instrumental in helping me start to realize my superpowers as and and things that I just saw things differently because there wasn't somebody like me in the room. Mm -hmm. And then that she really helped me understand that that wasn't there was something wrong with me. That was my default mode of assuming there was something wrong because I wasn't seeing what the others were seeing or I was thinking differently. And instead realizing that those were my special strengths. That was really something that I could bring to the table. And so now I am trying to give that gift back for other women to help them when they're in these rooms where they don't see other people that look like them to kind of understand the environment that they're in and also really have confidence in who they are, their skills and what they bring to a room. So that's my, my journey to where I am today. Yeah. What a powerful reframe as well mm. that because we don't think about when we are the one on the outside, we can often easily say, oh, they all get it and I don't. We become that, like we we create that meaning when really they're at far more danger of group think and we bring so much when we're the one that has a different observational view. And uh, we, haven't dug in, we haven't dug into the Enneagram, you and I, but I have <laughs> thoughts about that. And 
about your type. And one of the powers of the type, I think you might be, is that <laughs> observational power of being the one who looks around the room and sees things differently. Mm -hmm. And it's such a key power mm -hmm. um, of that personality type. And you also just have owned it as who you are as a woman, as a mother, as a leader in that space. And I think that's incredibly powerful for those of us, you know, listening to remind that, oh, different doesn't always mean bad. Now, sometimes we come up against that, though. And I think one of the things you said earlier is like you loved developing processes and then mm -hmm. also developing people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always think about processes is that they're here to serve people. They're here to processes is always to serve the purpose and the people that it, they it, they help. How how have you seen processes be really powerful for women leaders yeah. in that type of space that are in a male dominated space or industry? And how have you seen those processes be really unhelpful? Like what have you observed around those, the processes? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as from a helpful perspective, I think a lot about, you know, some of the things that I, I talk about a lot now. And, and one of them is like this concept of, you know, proactive pauses and mm -hmm. in and of itself is a process, right? Where it's like systematically setting aside time to pause and reflect. Mm -hmm. And through that process, and you can do this in a work environment too, where you do like business reviews, monthly or quarterly business reviews. And it's this idea of really grounding yourself in, in facts and data and claiming what has happened. Um, and uh, by doing that, by giving your yourself time and space to reflect um, and follow a process, if you will, that it really allows you to move forward with intention. Mm. And so I think what's really great about uh, informed processes, processes that are built on on, on facts, on data, on historical information, um, they give you a degree of confidence of what needs to happen in order to move forward. So it allows you to build a strategy and have confidence in your strategy. So that is really powerful. I think from a process perspective, it takes a lot of mystery out. Um, and then it really helps you hone in on where maybe there was a miss when things don't go as planned. So process can be really powerful. Um, I think the the downside of process is if we were too rigid with it, if mm. we are unwilling to evolve it as we gather new information. And so I think this is where sometimes um, you know, when you bring an outside perspective, there's great value because you are bringing expertise maybe from a different industry or a different role. And so you have a fresh set of eyes on a process. Um, and so I think that's something that where process can really work against you is when you, you get too rigid and too protective of it and are unwilling to adapt it as things evolve and as you acquire new information and, um, and kind of blindly stick to it, even though it's not really working for you anymore yeah. or for your team or for your company. So those would be, I'd say, the pros and the cons of, yeah. of the process. No, I think that's so important, too. I think one of the things that I have noticed when I have been in spaces where I'm the outsider and I come in to like one of the first questions I ask is, well, talk to me about how you do this. Mm. Just like, tell me what your process is. And some people are like, oh, <laughs> we have we have this process. And then I observe for a while and they think it's A, B, C. And it's actually A, go to the store bicycle, but like, like that's actually the process that's happening. And they don't notice that that process is actually not serving them because they're not following their own. Process. Well, isn't that such an interesting experience where coming from the outside where there's a disconnect perhaps between leadership yep. and what's actually happening. That's a huge, that's, that's a really great signal, you know, and I think about even to like, for so much of what I did, scaling, right? So mm -hmm. like what ends up happening when you scale and if you scale too fast without process is that you end up with a game of telephone mm -hmm. where you have people relaying their interpretation of what needs to be done to be successful. And after you do that a couple of times, you you do get really like your process, like you could probably come into an organization and ask three different people what you do to be successful and get three different answers. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who knows the importance of having consistency that, you know, that that always gave me the sweats under the armpits thinking about that. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Process can be really illuminating too of where there might be disconnects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I want, I'd love to pivot just a little bit to talk about what is it like when you're the woman pointing out that there's a struggle? Like I'm, I've noticed this, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I have to work really hard on kind of staying with, I actually know what I'm talking about because sometimes I just get like, 
it's nervous isn't quite the right word. I am afraid of the response is actually the right. I, I'm not nervous. I'm like, what am I going to get? Even though I know that I have something important to add. And I think mm. that that happens a lot for women because we are taught, I think, through culture to second guess ourselves. So how do you how do you see that happening in the workplace? And then what do you do with the women you're supporting yeah. to help them make that switch that your coach helped you? Like what you have to offer is actually a benefit to, to your organization. Right. Yes. Oh gosh. <laughs> it's um, a, a whole thing we could talk about. Ooh, yeah. So I think one of the, one of the most powerful and pretty simple reframes is when you think about going into that meeting is, um, you were invited for a reason. Mm. And so I think that's like one of the most important things is not, should I be here? But I was asked to be here for a yeah. reason. And so I think that's a really important thing of like, you are being asked to be here because you're bringing a perspective. And so that helps a lot. And then the other piece of this too is, um, you know, I think so much as women, what I love is that we have this beautiful caretaking side of us. We, um, you know, we really are mindful of others. And so we don't want to be selfish. Oftentimes that can hold us back of like, you know, we don't want to do something that's selfish. And so I think what can be really great is, um, again, a reframe is like, it would be selfish not to say something. Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Tell us more. Yeah. So, I mean, this idea of like, if, if nobody is bringing up something that seems very obvious to you and it, it's looking like the moment is going to pass, then what are the, what are the consequences of not saying something, right? It, it, you're withholding information and it would be selfish, not selfless to mm -hmm. stay quiet. And so I think sometimes when it can be really intimidating to raise a hand in a room, to have a voice, it's trying to let's leverage kind of what's been indoctrinated into us, conditioned into us to our advantage, because we mm -hmm. don't want to be selfish as women in general. Yeah, like most right. of us, I, like that makes us feel really terrible. And so, you know, that's a great way I found is like, it would be, it would be selfish not to say something. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would also say too is, you know, what I have found in my experience is there has absolutely been times where I've been in a room, I've had the courage to speak up and it's been either, you know, I've, I've, I haven't gotten a good reaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's something that's really, really important is to separate yourself from what's happening mm -hmm. and objectively looking at, and this is where I think, again, coaches are really valuable to talk through these scenarios, to understand like what it is. Um, because part of what you can learn is recognizing an environment that you're in. Yeah. So sometimes when you speak up, it allows you an opportunity to gather information. Is there a better way you could deliver it? So I'm going to give a very specific example. I love it. <laughs> I remember <laughs> earlier on in my career, I was reporting, I was at an earlier stage startup. We were about 120 employees. I was on the senior leadership team. I was reporting to the CEO and I was really good at saying no. <laughs> if anybody has been told no, we that that does not feel good, period. And so what I learned is that rather than saying no, we should do that, is instead, you know, saying no without saying no. Mm. Right. So it's like, oh, have we considered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As an alternative. So I think like there's so there's room to say, could I, could I improve? And then there's also what's really, really important is. Sometimes there's nothing else you can do and it's acknowledging the situation that you're in. Yeah. Because there are very real biases as women in the workplace that still exist that you are bumping up against. And so mm -hmm. it's really, really important that when you speak up based off of the reaction, if there's something you can grow, great. If it's you've done everything in your power to put the information out there and the best way it could be received and it still is you're not being met with you're being met with resistance then take that into consideration about the environment you're in. And then you then you make a choice from there. Yeah. But I think the most important thing is like, allow that to inform what you do. But this isn't about, is there something wrong with me? This mm -hmm. is about recognizing a situation or maybe a culture that you're yeah. in. I think that's incredibly important. And I, I want to underline it. There's a, a quote. It's not Emily P. Freeman's quote, but she always quotes somebody else. And someday I'll learn who said it. Um, but it is, we get into trouble and we don't name things properly. Mm -hmm. And so when we name, mm -hmm. oh, this is the environment that I'm in, I am living mm -hmm. in an environment that, you know, if you're living in a corporate space was really designed either by, you know, 1990s tech guys, 
or maybe even older situations where the workplace was designed for men who had stay-at-home wives who only worked from nine to five and they didn't take anything home with them, that that pervades the situation. And then when you realize, oh, that's what I'm in, I'm naming that, mm -hmm. you are able to separate your worth, your skills, your contribution from that space. And yeah. otherwise, it's crazy making. It's crazy right. making. It, it really is. It's how you burn out. Mm -hmm. It's how you burn out. And so I think that's because I think what also happens is that there is a lot of mental energy that goes into that constant awareness of how am I showing up and am I coming across the right way? Oh, hey, that takes a toll on you. It's exhausting. It is. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the other piece of like when you're when you're in a situation, if you know, in the circumstance where you're maybe not supported or you're meeting a lot of resistance, again, it's it's you can decide does it make sense for me to say, because there's something really valuable I'm getting from this mm -hmm. that makes it worth kind of the toll it's taking or is it not? And, and then again, right. What do I want to do with this? So I do, there's something so powerful about naming, naming it for what it is and then deciding what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it separate. It's not that we can't be emotional about that because there are all kinds of emotions that are wrapped up in it. Um, but the emotions aren't the thing that is, running it. It's like, oh, I have these emotions because these things are crazy making. I have these emotions because this doesn't feel good. Yeah. And, you know, and, and acknowledging that is really important. And But then we make a decision based on reality. Right. Not that emotions aren't a part of reality, but they're not the whole thing. Right. Um, and I think that's important for men and women. There are lots of men that think they're not emotional leaders and they incredibly are. Um. <laughs> and there is an emotion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I will say this. Dr. Yeah. Susan David is this brilliant psychologist. She has a great book called Emotional Agility. Yes, so good. And yeah. one of the things that I, I really enjoyed about her book was she talks about uh, strong negative emotions are data points. Yes. And they inform there. It's usually when a value is getting stepped on. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's really great, too, for you is like, those are when you do have an intense emotional reaction, something that actually catches you off guard, then that, there's a really neat opportunity to take a step back and explore that because mm -hmm. something important to you is being compromised. And so it, it could, again, be very informative to what is in conflict here. Mm hmm. So good. So good. Um, okay. So we have to stop. And <laughs> I'm like, I just feel like we just got started. Um, you are so great at helping women do, I mean, you've given us so many good things about how to reframe that, um, mm. a step back, the data point. There's just so much value that we don't want it to end. How can we stay up with you? How can people connect with yeah. you? What do you have for them? Tell us all the things. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so many ways. Let's, let's be friends and hang out. So I've got my website, margaretwinegar.com. You can go, yep. Right there. Use the QR code. Um, I have a podcast called rising tide where I interview career driven women. And then I do solo episodes as well, as well. I'll go deeper into certain topics and resources and frameworks to help you really get aligned on who you are and where you can show up best. You can live as the fullest version of yourself. And then um, come follow along with me on social. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, both of those are at Rising Tide podcast. And then you can follow me here on LinkedIn. Yes. Margaret's podcast is lovely. Yes. It, I so enjoy listening to it and you've done it for so long. And the data that you have gotten from listening to women's stories in leadership, I think is incredibly powerful. So you have a really wonderful thing going there. Well, thank and, you. And if you haven't listened, Jen is one of our recent <laughs> guests. So go check her out. It's really it was great. a fun, fun episode to do. I had some things I hadn't thought about in a long time. And I, I was funny because I had been listening to some other people and I was like, she's going to do something like that to me too. I know that's going to happen. <laughs> it's no problem at all. It's so good because I think the power of the stories that you hear in the women who are leading are so informative to us who are also leading. Like the stories are what impact us and, and how you guide those frameworks out as well, I think are incredibly powerful and helpful. So go listen to Rising Tide, follow Margaret in all the fun places. And if everything is here, you know, if you forget, um, we so appreciate your time. Thank you for being on today. You were yes. just lovely. Thank you for having me. 
Absolutely. I am here live every week at 1 p.m. Eastern. Next week, we have Marley Mocker, who is the party boss and also the author of a book, But Are You Making Any Money? And so she's talking about events and entrepreneurship, and she is just also going to fill your cup a little bit with the importance of how you lead in those spaces. So thank you for coming today, Margaret. Join us next week, everybody, and we will see you then. Bye, everybody.